It's no secret that the TOEFL reading section is tough, particularly TOEFL reading inference questions. I mean, first of all, you might not even know what an inference is, right? And then on top of that, you're not sure how to answer this question well. So I'm going to talk about all of that right now. In this lecture, we're going to talk about what an inference question is, some specific strategies to help you answer TOEFL reading inference questions so you know exactly what to do on test day. So, my name is Josh McPherson. I am the head instructor of TST Prep, an online TOEFL school where our mission is simple, to help you get the TOEFL score you need as quickly and easily as possible. And today, we're going to talk all about TOEFL reading inference questions. Let's do it. So let's start by talking about our objectives today. So by the end of this, you're going to be able to define what an inference is and how to look on the TOEFL. So we're going to take some time talking about what an actual inference is first. You're going to be able to avoid making the same common mistake as most other TOEFL takers when answering inference questions. And you're going to be able to use your understanding of modifiers and conditions to identify the correct answer. Don't worry if you have no idea what a modifier or a condition is. We're going to talk about that in a lot more detail. And just to give you a heads up, this might be a little bit long, uh, this lecture. There's a lot to talk about, so sit back, relax, and I hope you learned something here. Okay, so let's get right into it. One thing I do want to say, and I encourage students to think about their own strategy and compare it to my own. Feel free to take what you like and ditch what you do not like. So basically, you know, there might be things in this, uh, in this lecture that you like, things that you don't like. Don't worry about doing exactly what I say. This is just ex from my experience teaching students, but every person is different. You are an individual. You have your own strengths and weaknesses. So feel free to test what I'm going to say to you and see if it works for you. Okay? All right. So let me get into it. Here's an example of what an inference question looks like. Uh, this is from one of TST Prep's complete tests, and the question says, what can be inferred from paragraph five about the workers in Taylor's theory? So inference questions are pretty easy to spot because they use verbs infer, imply, or suggest. So there's 10 different question types. These are eight rules that we give students to find the correct question type. Uh, we're not going to talk about this in a lot of detail. I talk about it in another lecture. But basically, if you need to know what's an inference question, it'll use one of these three words as a verb. Infer, imply, or suggest. All right, that's that. Now, what is an inference? Let's, let's take a step back for a minute. What is an inference? Well, an inference is a conclusion based on evidence and reasoning. Inference and author's purpose questions are not directly stated in the passage. So that's the most important thing to keep in mind, is that the answer is not directly stated in the passage. For factual information questions, the answer is in the passage. For most of the questions, the answer is in the passage. For these, they're probably not. You have to make a guess based on the information in the passage, and I'm going to show you how to do that. But that's what an inference is. So. Here are some everyday examples of inferences that you do. You do this every day, whether you know it or not. You look out the window and notice clouds in the sky. You take an umbrella because you guess it might rain. So that's an inference. You see clouds, take a guess, might rain, you take an umbrella. Another example, you're speaking about your problems at work to a friend and he yawns. You stop talking about work and instead ask about his life. This happens to me pretty often, talking about my own life. People are not so interested. People are much more interested in their own life. So again, this is an, an example of me making an inference. Somebody yawns, okay, they don't want to hear about me. They want me to ask questions about them, maybe. Or I should just stop talking in general. So, uh, so yeah, so that's an inference that you can make every day. So we do this, you do this every day. Inference examples. She almost always comes to work on time. So based on this sentence, what's an inference you can make? Think about it for a second. You can pause the video at any time if you want. I'm not going to pause. I'm going to just keep going, but you can pause the video anytime. Here is that she sometimes comes to work late. If she almost always comes to work on time, well, maybe there's a couple times where she's late. Or she's a reliable employee. Almost always comes to work on time. Sounds pretty good. Sounds pretty reliable. Another example here. An area of land is considered a desert if it receives less than four inches of annual rainfall. So it receives less than four in inches of annual rainfall. Well, some inference I can make there is that areas that receive more than four inches are not deserts. 
Okay? So I'm taking the information I'm given and taking one step further, making a conclusion based on what I'm given. And again, we do this all the time, every day. So you make inferences every day, do the same with the information you read in the TOEFL passages. You don't have to do this a lot, you just can do it for the TOEFL question, the inference question, because most of the questions you don't have to make an inference, but it is something that comes up often and something that you can do more of if you need to. But just focus on it for inference and author's purpose questions for the most part. Okay, so how can you make an inference? The first thing is that you, the first way you can make an inference is to analyze the modifier. Josh, what's a modifier? Okay, well, let me give you an example. Uh, a modifier is an adjective or adverb usually. So a word or phrase that supplies additional information about another word or phrase. We're gonna keep it simple. Modifiers are actually a little bit more complicated than this if you open up a grammar book, but we're just gonna focus on adjectives and adverbs here for the TOEFL. So a big dog, big is an adjective. It's modifying the noun dog. Another example, ran quickly. Quickly is modifying the verb run. How do you run? Oh, I run quickly. So modifiers come up again and again on the TOEFL. And it's really helpful for you to pay attention to these modifiers because it's an easy way to make a wrong answer. But that's another whole lecture. But here are some examples of some modifiers. Extreme modifiers, all, always, never, only, which means 0% or 100%. These are usually indicate that it's a wrong choice on the TOEFL. There's frequency modifiers, usually sometimes, almost always. Degree modifier, this is probably the most popular modifier on the TOEFL. Some, most, almost all. It shows you the levels of something. And time modifier. Time is actually usually a noun and not really a modifier, but it could be used as one. And dozen, millennium, and century are a couple of examples there. Here's a list of examples that you, of inferences you can make with a modifier. So I'm gonna run through this list so it can become much clearer to you how you can actually make an inference. So it's one of the biggest buildings in the world. One of means that there are other bigger buildings in the world, uh, that there are other buildings that are bigger. It's not, it's the biggest building, it's one of the biggest. So then I can make this inference. He owned most of the land. Well, there's some land he doesn't own. There are 500 known butterfly species. Well, there's probably some unknown butterfly species too because they're using known. Those are known, why even say that? Well, probably because there's some that are unknown. This is the best TOEFL course. So this is of course the best TOEFL course. So this is part of our uh, TOEFL score builder program and our TOEFL emergency course, tsdprep.com, a little plug there. But yeah, so this is the best TOEFL course. There are other TOEFL courses, but they're just not so good. And another example, there is usually enough snow to go see, skiing in December. Sometimes there's not enough snow. Okay, so these modifiers, you can make inferences based on them. And I hope that becomes a little bit clearer there. The second way you can make an inference is to understand the conditions. This was about the rainfall example. But it, here's a different example. And before I get into the example, let me explain what is a condition. A condition describes the necessary state that must exist in order for something to be possible. Think of conditions like learning the rules for a game you have never played. So this is very popular in TOEFL because they're giving you information about topics and to understand topics you have to understand the rules that they operate by, the conditions. So here's an example. There are two teams and each team is allowed to have 11 players on the field. So if they're allowed to have 11 players on the field, Maybe an inference I can make is that they're not allowed to have 12 or more players. Or maybe I can make an inference that this is a soccer game, for example. Right? So those are inferences based on conditions. Conditions will vary greatly on test day. There's a lot of different conditions. Here are a few examples from our complete test number 13. You can also download a free copy of our complete test at tstprep.com. I'll run through these. Margaret Fuller also came to prominence as a leading transcendentalist and advocate for women's equality. Well, so if she was an advocate for women's equality, well, then women were probably not treated equally while she was alive. Conventional agriculture is ill-suited to solve the crisis, but hydroculture might be a potential solution. What's my inference? Well, hydroculture is probably unconventional. The sentence begins with conventional and then contrasts with hydroculture. Well, probably it's unconventional.
Another example, the indoor location allows farmers to create controlled environments. Well, outdoor locations are probably harder to control. Organizational psychology had its origins in the early 20th century. Maybe it didn't exist before the 20th century. Unlike most other academic fields, business leaders immediately understood how research into worker psychology and productivity could have a positive impact on both the worker's well-being and the company's profit margins. Well, I guess business leaders are not usually interested in other academic fields, unlike most other academic fields. So as you can see here, these conditions, you maybe see some modifiers as well. Uh, I wouldn't worry too much about is it a modifier as a condition? Just focus on understanding how to make the inference and understanding the conditions that are there. Anyway, the majority of your learning will come through practice. I want you to understand that these conditions and modifiers are going to be helpful for you. And probably right now you're thinking, oh, this is cool. This is interesting. I kind of get it now. I see where I can make an inference but you will have to practice. So definitely practice these skills to help build them over time. So at this point, you know about modifiers and conditions and you have a better idea of how to make an inference. At this point, let's start talking about the actual TOEFL questions. Let's look at some examples and review what inference questions look like and ways to answer them so you can feel more confident and comfortable when you take the test. So let's get into this next part here. We actually talk about the TOEFL reading inference questions. Here are four things you must know. The first thing is that you'll get zero to one inference question per passage. They're not so common. You'll probably have about three in the entire TOEFL reading section. Also, try to answer in 90 seconds or less. You don't have too much time for these. The question wording will always include infer, imply, or suggest, like I mentioned before and inferences are not directly stated in the passage like we just talked about, right? So here are some examples of the popular question wording. This is how the question will look when you actually take the test. Which of the following can be furred about, blah, 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 blah. The author of the passage implies that, blah, 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 blah. Which of the following can be inferred from paragraph one about, blah, 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 blah. So hopefully you see uh, from those examples that they always use infer, imply, or suggest there, okay? And so again, this is one of the rules for question wording. It'll always have infer, imply, suggest, as I said before. Okay, second thing you have to know is that you have to read the question carefully. Now, why do I say this? Well, let's look at an example. What can be inferred from paragraph five about the workers and Taylor's theory? There's the word infer. You see infer, you should know it's an inference question, but a lot of students don't see it. So a lot of students start to answer this question like a factual information question, like it's a detail that they have to find the fact. They have to find the fact in the reading. This is not what you're doing. You have to make inferences, guesses, good guesses, based on the information that's there. That's a different thing. So if you're looking at the paragraph trying to find the correct answer, then you're going to be answering the wrong question. They're not asking you what's the detail, what's the fact, what's true. They're asking you what inference can you make based on this information. That's a different question. So if you answer this based on factual information, you'll get it wrong. And that's one of the most common ways that people get inference questions wrong. They answer the wrong question. They don't know it's an inference question. They forget that it's an inference question. Make sure you know you don't misread the question and that you know it's an inference question. Make sure you do that. I can't say that enough. It's not a detailed question. It's not directly stated in the passage, usually. It's something that you have to infer, that you have to guess. Very important here. Pro tip, the answer to an inference question is not usually directly stated in the passage, which is what I just said, which is why it's crucial that you read carefully. So read very carefully. Make sure you understand the question. Crucial. All right, thing number three, the next thing you must know is that this question requires reading most of the given paragraph. So you're gonna have to eliminate three choices. And to do that, you have to look at all of the choices and you have to read the paragraph and start eliminating. You have to basically say, I can't make that inference. I can't make that inference. I can't make that inference. That one I can make. And that's how you get the answer to the question. So it requires quite a bit, bit of reading here.
Now here's one reason why you might have to read the whole paragraph is that the keywords are everywhere. Uh, keywords is a strategy we use basically that in the question there are some words that you can use to find the answer quickly. But if you look at this question, the keywords, workers, tailors, theory, are everywhere in this passage. So it doesn't help so much for you to use these keywords to help you find the sentence where it's located. So you have to read quite a bit of this paragraph. So again, keywords are sometimes so common in the given paragraph that they will not help you find where the answer is located. But we can look at this in more detail and show you how you will need to read a lot of the paragraph to find the inference. So I've highlighted each option choice to show you where it's located in the paragraph. And I want you to note first that it's in three different places, right? So you have to read quite a bit of the paragraph already. Let's start with the choice A, where it's highlighted in yellow. Distilled water has a negative impact on the growth of plants. And the sentence says, it's grown best when raised in water that is rich in various nutrients rather than in distilled water. I don't think that's correct because look here, negative impact. So that's a modifier, negative. It doesn't say that distilled water is negative. It just says it doesn't grow as well as other water. So that's why that modifier is wrong there. A is incorrect. B, NASA is planning to use hydroponics to create farms in space. So let me read the red part. It says, these days, even NASA, the US government agency, so that's good, in charge of space missions, is researching hydroponics. So researching hydroponics and growing space farms are two very different conditions here. So, you know, creating farms in space and researching hydroponics, I can't make that inference. I can't guess that they're gonna make farms in space just because they're doing research on hydroponics. That's too far. I look at C, the first experiments in hydro hydroponics were mostly unsuccessful. I see all the passage, although it may seem like a technologically sophisticated form of agriculture, scientists have been experimenting with hydroculture since at least 1627. Early experiments show that plants grow best, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so the first experiments, early experiments, were mostly unsuccessful. They don't say they're unsuccessful. They just say some water was better than this other distilled water. So it's probably D, and let's look at D. Hydroponics is a simpler form of agriculture than people believe. The part highlighted in blue. Although it may seem like a technologically sophisticated form of agriculture, scientists have been experimenting with it since at least 1627. So it's a simpler form than most people feel. So I can make that inference that it's a simpler form because it's saying that people think it's complicated, but it's not so complicated. Been doing it for hundreds of years already. So that's an example there. And again, focus on conditions and modifiers for answers. So this is the fourth thing that you should know. I just wanted to uh, restate this and so you can see examples of it. And again, remember a modifier for our purposes here is either an adjective or an adverb. Big for dog, the big dog, instead of just dog, the big dog. And adverb, run quickly. So quickly is going to change the verb run. And here are the examples of modifiers again. I already talked about this, but I'll just say the first one again. One of the biggest buildings in the world. Well, I think that there are other buildings that are bigger because it says one of. Now let's see this in action on an actual TOEFL question. Distilled water has a negative impact. Well, it doesn't say it has a negative impact. It just says it grows best. That word negative, that modifier changed it, right? B. NASA is planning to use hydroponics to create farms. That's too far of a condition, right? Cre they don't want to create farms, they're just researching hydroponics. We don't know if they want to create farms or not. Here we have the modifier, mostly unsuccessful. Well, not really. It says that actually it's just that one water grows better than the other. Mostly is a strong modifier there. And also the condition unsuccessful is just wrong. And then we have D, a simpler form of agriculture. We can make that inference that it's simple than, simpler than most people think based on the information in the passage. And again, what is a condition? A condition is the second way that you find an inference, and that is kind of like the rules of the game. For example, each team is allowed to have 11 players on the field. An inference I can make is that if you have 12 players, you can't play.
for example. And I went through all of these examples already for conditions, but just to give you a quick little refresh, Margaret Fuller also came to prominence as a leading transcendentalist and advocate for women's equality. Well, probably women were not treated equally while she was alive. All right, let's see this in action here. And again, Margaret Fuller here. She was the most famous transcendentalist of her time. We have this phrase, most famous, that's too strong. They called her a leading transcendentalist. Doesn't mean she's the most famous. That modifier is wrong. She attended Harvard. Well, they actually say she could not attend Harvard, so it's not true. She could use the library, but she could not attend Harvard. Wrong condition there. She held positions that most women did not in her time. Now, this is a condition that's true, and I'll talk about that in a minute. I'll I want to talk about the wrong answers first. D, she only reviewed books, so you see that word only. That's a pretty extreme modifier, probably wrong. Let's go back to C. I'm going to read the part highlighted in blue. However, she was later granted the use of the library there because of her towering intellect. In 1840, she became editor of The Dial, a transcendentalist journal, and she later found employment as a book reviewer for the New York Tribune newspaper. All this information here, all these conditions, she was able to use the library at Harvard, she was an editor of a newspaper, she was a leading transcendentalist journalist. All of this information, on top of everything else in this paragraph, I can make the inference C. She held positions that most women did not in her time because of all the conditions that have been laid out. She wasn't able to attend Harvard, she could use the library, she was an editor of a newspaper, and she was a, a researcher, a writer, a journalist for another newspaper. Probably she held positions that most women couldn't at her time. So hopefully you can see those conditions there. Pro tip, inference questions are often spread out across multiple sentences, so read most of the given paragraph for the answer. Just wanted to say that one more time. And also, don't forget, visit the website tstprep.com. We have something for every TOEFL student. In my experience, there are four different types of st TOEFL students. Ones who have less than a month or more than a month, or you need to improve your TOEFL skills, or your TOEFL skills and English fluency. And no matter what category you're in, we have something for you. So if you have less than a month and just need TOEFL, emergency course is perfect, the basic. The orange part, if you have more than a month, number two, and you just need TOEFL skills, then you should do the emergency course premium. There's more practice for you to do, for you to do more sample tests. If you have less than a month and you need TOEFL skills and you need to improve your English fluency, then pray, we don't do anything about that. Fluency takes time to build. And this next uh, course that we have, the TOEFL Score Builder Program, it improves your TOEFL skills and your English fluency. I'm really excited about this. It has daily practice designed to build the skills that you need for the TOEFL. And of course, visit TST Prep. We have uh, classes, teachers, evaluations, all that good stuff. So I hope you feel like by now that you are able to define what an inference is and how to look on the TOEFL and you're able to avoid making the same mistake as most other TOEFL takers do, remember to read the question carefully, and you're able to use your understanding of modifiers and conditions to identify the correct answer. Okay, thank you guys for watching. You could be doing so many things right now, but you're studying for the TOEFL. Be proud of yourself, seriously. Like, like I mean, this is the internet. You could do anything, right? But you're studying for the TOEFL. I'm proud of you for getting this far. Thank you for sharing your time with me. Your time is precious. And yeah, that's it. I look forward to seeing you in the next video. All right, take care, guys.